coming on the air with questions about what is really out there. Not aliens, apparently, but the White House says it doesn't know what exactly it keeps shooting out of the sky. The search is on for debris from the Great Lakes to the Arctic Circle, with lawmakers demanding answers now. We've got the latest, including the new first comments from the Defense Secretary on this whole thing. We're also going to take you inside a hospital in Turkey, working around the clock to help survivors of that devastating earthquake, with emotional new video of a four-year-old being rescued. Plus, we're bringing you never before seen numbers from the CDC showing the unprecedented crisis for teen girls in this country who say they're feeling sad and hopeless. What it says about how the conversation on mental health is starting to shift in this country. And Adidas scrambling to figure out what to do with the billion dollars worth of Yeezy shoes after dropping Kanye West. Why just giving it all away isn't so easy. And in tonight's original, are diamonds still a girl's best friend? Not according to younger potential brides, why a bunch of them are ditching the rings in favor of tats. That's later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and that unidentified object drama is getting more dramatic today with the question we're trying to figure out. Are there just more of them out there in the sky? Or is the U.S. just paying more attention to what's out there in the sky? Because the Pentagon has shot down three things. They're not calling them balloons at this point, but three objects in three days. And late today, we're hearing from Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin for the first time about all of it, saying the military is scrambling 24-7 to get the debris. And he's trying not to freak any of us out about it all. I want to reassure Americans that these objects do not present a military threat to anyone on the ground. They do, however, present a risk to civil aviation and potentially an intelligence collection threat. And we'll get to the bottom of it. Okay, well, let's see, because the map that you're seeing right here lays it all out, right? With objects shot down over Alaska, over Canada, over Michigan, all about a week after that Chinese spy balloon got shot down over South Carolina. So here's what we know. Here's what we're learning about this all. They're not tracking any new objects today. As Secretary Austin said, no debris recovered yet. We know the U.S. shot down a couple of things over the weekend because of an apparent threat to commercial planes. Whatever was in the sky wasn't manned. They couldn't be maneuvered like the first balloon. No reason right now to believe they were surveillance. And they're pretty sure that it's not something ET-ish. Watch. There is no, again, no indication of aliens or extraterrestrial activity with these recent takedowns. Okay, no aliens. Got it. That is cleared up. But a lot of other stuff is not, right? We don't know where these things are from. We don't know how Beijing is going to respond to all of it. They've already been accusing the U.S. of flying objects over Chinese airspace. The U.S. says that's not the case. And we don't know if any of this info is going to satisfy lawmakers who are demanding more answers from a White House that says it's being as transparent as it can be. As we're coming on the air, we're just now hearing that senators will get a classified briefing tomorrow morning. We've got more on all that in a second. But I want to bring in Ali Rafa, who is joining us now from outside the White House. Ali, let's go back to this big question that to me frames so much of it, right? Are there more objects or are we just tracking them more closely? And based on what we've been hearing from officials today, it seems like it's more the latter. Yeah, Hallie, it's an incredibly important question that would be able to give this situation some sort of perspective that at this point it doesn't have right now. Uh, Air Force General Charles Brown had some insight about this earlier today. Take a listen. As we uh, looked at uh, over the course of uh, the past week or so, is the you know better scrutiny of, of our uh, airspace, um, also the uh, adjusting of the radar uh, sensitivities, which means we're seeing more things than we um, would normally see. Now, John Kirby in the White House briefing earlier today said, as you mentioned at the top there, no unidentified suspicious objects are currently being tracked. And he said that uh, U.S. efforts to surveil and monitor these unidentified objects, yes, has ramped up. But he didn't answer the specific question of whether the actual number, the total of these identified objects, have whether there's been an uptick of them in recent years, recent months possibly, whether we don't have that information because we didn't 
have the technology or we weren't paying attention to these objects as carefully as we are now. Uh, Kirby saying that the uh, abilities and these new these new abilities to detect these objects has been ramped up since the Chinese spy balloon was discovered. That's still unclear. So it's going to be interesting to see over the next few weeks and months whether we continue to see this uptick, uh, whether yeah. we can see we continue to see the White House react in the way that we have seen them react to these unidentified objects. That is the big question. Ali Rafa starting us off here live outside the White House. Let me go to our chief foreign correspondent, Andrea Mitchell, to get into some of the political pressure on the White House and the, and the, the sort of the thirst for answers from not just lawmakers, Andrea, but the American public, because the White House officials are insisting they don't know what these things are. They're things, they're about the size of the small car, right, beyond the Chinese spy balloon. One of them is an octagon with a bunch of strings. One of them is kind of cylindrical. Do, do they really, truly, Andrea, not have a clue what these objects are, or are they just not telling us? And I realize that may be an impossible question for you to answer, but help us understand some of this. A little bit impossible, but there is some reality here, a reality check. These three objects, one over Lake Huron, freezing icy water, and the others over the Arctic and over the Yukon, this is icy territory. The FBI and the Royal Canadian, the Canadian Royal Mounted Police are up there jointly trying to find out what's happening over the Yukon, an area I've actually been to, the Jubilee mm -hmm. Valley. But uh, they, they don't know. And without capturing some debris, because as you know, they've gotten some electronics out of the water off the Atlantic that they have retrieved, so they've got a better sense of what was going on with that spy balloon. But they don't know, was this from China? Were these one or another mm. of them from China? Were they from another foreign adversary? Russia, Iran, who knows? Was it civilian? Was it academic, private sector? You know, Elon Musk. I mean, there's so much stuff out there. And the bottom line is we're now seeing so much more because they've tweaked the radar. Since the China you know, balloon got away with crossing the U.S. homeland, coast to coast, and so many lawmakers getting really angry and sounding yeah. off, Democrats as well as Republicans. Now you're hearing the Democrats I talked to, as well as Republicans, from that briefing they had, the Michigan caucus, the Michigan delegation, not happy with the White House because they're not getting answers. And they're asking the same questions we're asking. Is it because they're looking more intently and all this stuff has always been out there? Or is it because they don't want to tell us? Uh, they don't know. I think it's pretty much they don't know because they've gotten no debris from any of these three objects and they're all different. And they do know that they, they're saying at least that they were not sending signals. So they've intercepted, they've figured out they were not sending signals. They would have known. But they were flying so low they had to take them down because they were, unlike the Chinese balloon, which was 60,000 feet up, these were, as Lloyd Austin said in Brussels today, these were a threat to U.S. civilian aircraft. And That's that right. is a red line. As you say, Alex. Andrea, once they get their hands on the debris and are able to analyze that, hopefully we will get some more answers, or at least they will, and then share it. You talked about lawmakers. Yeah. We know all senators will be getting a briefing tomorrow morning based on the latest reporting from our Capitol Hill team. You talk with folks in and around the intel community all the time, Andrea. What is your spidey sense telling you based on these conversations about how concerned they seem to be about this stuff in the air? Not that concerned because they weren't sending signals. So they, I mean, mm. there was an open question as to whether this was also surveillance, but they don't think so. That said, they're, they, they could have been more transparent. I mean, you know this, Hallie. You know, you've covered all these places. The bottom line is, why didn't they come out and say it? Why did it have to be dragged out of them at briefings? It's kind of analogous to the, class of the way this White House is handling, or handled, rather, the classified briefing material. It was only when, you know, Another network, CBS, first reported it that they revealed that. It was only when Courtney Kuby, our colleague here, reported on the China spy balloon. And again, at the briefing just this weekend, or Friday, they only announced that something had been shot down after reporters asked. Hmm. And that's leading to, you know, the vacuum. And people on the Hill are saying, in a vacuum, you know what happens? A lot of misinformation. And that led to, of course, the, the great question about whether or not this was an alien. And I think we can authoritarily say that the White House says, no aliens, no aliens here. I don't know about aliens, but no aliens here. If you had Andrea Mitchell talking about ETs on your bingo card, congratulations, because you're crushing yeah. the broadcast. Andrea Mitchell, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Great analysis. We'll look for more of you tonight on Nightly. Let's talk about what else is happening around the world on the ground, because you've got rescue crews in Turkey and Syria making a big final push to find survivors a week after those earthquakes devastated those two countries. And somehow, 
somehow against the odds, they are finding people alive. Look at this, including today, a 13-year-old boy who had been trapped for almost eight days, eight days. A few hours earlier, a little girl was pulled from a pile of rocks and taken to safety. You see it here. People were heard saying, God is great, just yelling it, shouts of joy. Remember, the usual window for rescues typically starts to close about three days after an earthquake. So what we're seeing now, these are the exception to the rule. They are rare and truly extraordinary. More than 35,000 people have been confirmed killed from those earthquakes. The Turkish government says more than a million people are homeless now. There's not enough tents or medical supplies, not even close for the survivors. And that is putting those survivors at risk. Gabe Gutierrez is joining, uh, joining us now here. And Gabe, you got some pretty rare access inside a hospital today. Tell us what you saw. They probably, my sense is, based on the reporting that we've seen from our teams, they don't have enough. Uh, well, Hallie, I... It is remarkable just how many people have been rescued over the past several days. And we were at Adana's city hospital here. And while the search and rescue operation in this city has wound down, they are still dealing with so many survivors. This one hospital we went to over the past week or so has treated 4,000 earthquake-related patients. They still have about 1,000 of them in the hospital, about 200 of them or so are children, and about half of those children, a little um, less than half or so, remain unidentified, Hallie. Just so tragic. Today we saw a two-month-old baby. Actually, they believe he's a two-month-old baby, but they don't know for sure because his parents are missing. And we also spoke with a seven-year-old girl, Tara Okram, and her, her and her father were rescued after 101 hours trapped underneath that rubble. And I spoke to them in their hospital room as they recovered. Take a listen to part of our conversation. How did you find the strength? Bu kuvveti içinden gelen senden yüksek sevdiğin yani ben kendimi ne kadar seviyorsam benden daha çok sevdiğim şahıs adına. So, Hallie, Jem is her father's name. His mother is still missing, but he is holding his daughter very tightly tonight. So grateful that she is alive. And get this, they passed the time while they were trapped by playing rock, paper, scissors. And this uh. is a beautiful little girl who is our privilege to meet. And she is just a beam of sunshine and a glimmer of hope amid all this tragedy. I have chills, Gabe, I'm hearing that story, right, of how they managed to spend their time and, and survive this just unimaginable loss, this horrific scene. When you look at what you're seeing on the ground, yes, those sort of remarkable and extraordinary stories of hope and survival, but then the pragmatic reality on the ground is that at some point, these communities are going to have to rebuild. They can't even begin to start thinking about that yet because the recovery is still happening, right? Yeah, in many communities. Now, here in Adana, the local government has actually said that they're stopping the search and rescue part of this. It's now a recovery mission. Uh, other cities, we were another one earlier today, Nordog, and they, they are extremely hard hit and still beginning the process of cleaning up, but they're still in a search and rescue mode there. We went to one site earlier today where there was a thought that there may have been uh, a survivor, perhaps, and they called in a search and rescue team, turned on not to be the case. Instead, they found the body of a 16-year-old girl, and we were there as their family was notified, and they're in the process of identifying that body. So, yes, rebuilding and it, it, for so much of southern Turkey would take so long. And, of course, Hallie, we, you know, we, we should also mention northwestern Syria, which is in very dire straits, and the government there is facing backlash for uh, reportedly blocking humanitarian aid coming into that country. So, so much need here as yeah. the death toll continues to climb now up more than 35,000 now. Can I just ask you about some of the criticism that we're also seeing in Turkey? Because officials there are investigating contractors for um, questions, right, about how some of these mm -hmm. buildings were constructed that ended up collapsing in these earthquakes. Do we know anything more about that? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So over the weekend, Tur Turkish prosecutors announced that they had issued at least 134 warrants for uh, building contractors who may have been responsible for uh, allegations of shoddy construction that could have cost lives. There is a lot of anger and frustration mounting against uh, many of those building contractors here in southern Turkey. And Hallie, I should mention actually where I'm standing, not the building right behind me, but the building I'm standing on, uh, or it's been largely cleaned up. It's a 16-story building that collapsed 
uh, according to local media, the uh, contractor who built this um, fled to, uh, to Cyprus and was arrested there. Um, and so, again, there is a, a huge backlash against some of these contractors who some, um, you know, people here in Turkey feel were may have been partly responsible for this huge death toll because they may have cut corners. Again, that the Turkish justice minister uh, is saying that by issuing uh, more than 100 warrants over the weekend, Hal. Wow. Here we are nearly eight days later, Gabe, but the sort of unraveling of how this disaster got to be so bad. It's going to take months, if not years. Gabe Gutierrez, live for us on the ground, continuing that incredible reporting in Turkey. Thank you, Gabe. Back home here, a judge in Georgia ruling today that some of the special grand jury report on former President Trump's possible interference in the 2020 election, guess what? We are going to see at least some of it on Thursday. It's only going to include three parts. The introduction, right, to the very beginning, the conclusion, the very end, and a section where jurors express some concerns that some witnesses may have lied under oath. Remember, this is a Fulton County grand jury that submitted their findings to the district attorney last month. She is going to have to decide now if she will file any criminal charges against the former president and his allies. Let's bring in Blaine Alexander in Atlanta. And Blaine, we've laid out how much is at stake here based on the decision making from the Fulton County DA. But talk to us about what we might expect to learn later in the week in this glimpse into the grand jury report and why it matters. Hallie, this is a, a key decision because of just what you said. This really is our first glimpse, our first look into what has been happening in this building behind me for the past many months. Of course, we've only been talking basically through sources or through the very few people who have talked about this. But with the release of these, these three sections, we'll finally get a chance to look at at least some bits of the conversation that have been happening. Right? We'll get a glimpse at some of the testimony uh, to some degree and potentially the mindset of the special grand jurors when we talk about the intro and the conclusion. I think that when we talk about about that portion, though, that one that's sandwiched in the middle of this kind of discussion about who possibly lied under oath, according to how the judge characterized it, that will certainly be telling as well. Remember, we're not going to find out the names of the people that they're talking about, but just the discussions around that, what gave them so, any sort of inkling that there were lies being told, is certainly something that's going to be close to watch. Blaine Alexander, live for us there in Georgia. Blaine, thank you very much. We have never seen before the number of teen girls experiencing this level of violence and sadness and suicide risk ever in this country, according to some new numbers now out from the CDC. 57% of these teens say they felt persistently sad or hopeless. That's almost double the rate of teen boys. 30% of these girls say they've seriously considered dying by suicide. That is up 60% over the last 10 years. LGBTQ plus teens, are continuing to face very high levels of violence and mental health challenges with this new report adding some urgency, basically sounding the alarm to say, hey, invest in schools, help the kids who are having such a struggle here. Erica Edwards joins us now. And Erica, we have laid out the numbers. They are staggering, right? I mean, they are staggering. They are disproportionately affecting more girls than boys. Why is that? Why is there a gender gap? Boy, yeah. So mental health issues among teenage girls have been growing for decades. And so there's no real one easy answer. However, I do want to point out that teen girls are particularly vulnerable to sexual violence. This report today found that 14 percent of teenage girls said that they had been raped. Hallie, that's more than one out of every te 10 teen girls that you and I know. And of course, that's only going to increase feelings of despair, sadness and hopelessness among a young woman. Hallie. The report suggests that schools have to play a part in trying to make this better. What can schools do, right? I mean, because that's going to take presumably money, investment, resources, things that are, that are not in like a lot of supply right now. The CDC said that schools should increase programs like basic sex ed to help address some of these issues. But as you mentioned, you know, schools are underfunded, teachers are underpaid, and many aren't getting the training that they need to deal with kids who sometimes on a daily basis come to them with feelings of their own depression or thoughts of hurting themselves. Today during the CDC briefing, the national PTA president called on Congress to increase funding targeted specifically at kids who have survived traumas. Callie. Um, one of the things that's interesting here, Erica, too, is like when we talk about mental health struggles, we know that the numbers here are not from like this year. The CDC is going back to the most recent set of numbers available. But you've seen more and more people, especially since the pandemic, famous people talk about their own mental health struggles. There is an awareness factor here. I've talked with the nation's Surgeon General about this, right? The idea that by opening up more, you can help, if not end the stigma, at least poke some holes in the stigma of talking about how difficult some of the stuff is. 
Yeah, it's incredibly important, especially when um, celebrities, you know, people that teens idolize, talk um, openly about their own mental health struggles. We need to normalize these conversations. But also, you know, consider the power of social media with all the bad that can come with it. Body image issues and, uh, you know, online bullying. There are now huge communities of people on TikTok and Snapchat all talking about their own, um, you know, past issues with depression or violence. And we have kids even snapping perfect strangers to ask them about their experiences and um, and get advice and help there are these there's this huge support system that was yeah. never there before social media Hallie Erica Edwards thank you very much for breaking that down for us we should note that if you or somebody else you know needs help if you or somebody you know is in crisis call or text 988 that is the suicide and crisis in the lifeline again that's 988 the number is right there on your screen there's also a text you can reach out to as well We've got some new video today showing former South Carolina attorney Alec Murdoch visibly shaken, sobbing in police body cam video on the night his wife and son were murdered in 2021. Murders that prosecutors say he is responsible for, but Murdoch denies. Take a look. This is some of the redacted version of that video that jurors saw in the courtroom. And see if you can listen to what Murdoch asked an officer responding to the scene. Listen. Somebody go to check him. Yes, sir. They, they've already checked them. <laughs> they did check them? Yes, sir. It's official that they're dead? Yes, sir. That's what it looks like. <laughs> He said, is it official that they're dead? A lot of the trial today was about other evidence, like DNA from the night of the murders on stuff like Alec Murdoch's clothes, on the steering wheel of the car he drove last night, or that night, I should say. It's week four of what some in the South are calling the South's trial of the century. You've seen dozens of witnesses called by the state. They're expected to finish up their case this week, and then the defense will present its case. Vaughn Hilliard is following the latest on all of it. And so, Vaughn, most of the witnesses today were experts in forensics who tested DNA evidence from the scene. What did they say that's helping to piece together what happened that night? And how did the video that we just showed play a part in that? Right. All of this circumstantial evidence, Hallie, is key and crucial to the prosecution because they have no evidence at this time that Alec Murdoch actually pulled the trigger on the gun that killed his wife and one of his sons here. Uh, the DNA that was put forward from the analyst from the South Carolina law enforcement Division uh, included the fact that uh, blood from Maggie Murdoch was found on the steering wheel that Alec Murdoch was, Murdoch was driving that very night here. There are questions as to how that blood would have gotten back into the vehicle here. The, this is a, a timeline in which Alec Murdoch says that he left the scene. You saw there, he told officers in that police body cam footage that he had left for about an hour and a half. Now, cell phone data from Alec Murdoch's phone shows a slightly different timeline here, and there's also new revelations that GM uh, is telling the prosecution that they are able to extract some data from the vehicle uh, from OnStar that would include the GPS uh, 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 geolocation data, as well as the speed in which that vehicle was driving. And so that is where you see the prosecution. They were expected to end uh, uh, bringing their witnesses forward uh, last week, but this case is continuing to go on here. And you've already heard from an employee of the family that it has suggested that the shirt that you saw in that body cam footage was not the same shirt that Alec Murdoch had on earlier that afternoon there. But you said it. Alec Murdoch was emotional uh, inside of the courtroom here today, particularly as a pathologist who conducted the autopsy of his wife and son, uh, displayed photos and described in which his son was shot by a mere three feet when he was killed there that evening in June. Let me ask about something else, Vaughn, because a couple of jurors today tested positive for COVID. They got dismissed. Alternates replaced them. But you had this issue brought up by both sides here, both the prosecution and defense, who said to the judge, basically, like, hey, if this keeps going at this rate, we may not get enough jurors to get to a verdict, meaning all of this could end up in the possibility of a mistrial. What the judge say? And all of these jurors were together on Friday, and Friends. we know how COVID works, and that is where you heard from the prosecution and the defense saying, hey, they are eager to get moving with this trial, but not at the risk of it becoming a mistrial here. And that is where you saw the judge, he dismissed those two jurors who tested positive here this morning, and we are down to just now three alternates, which the prosecution and the defense urged the judge to postpone the trial to essentially delay it. He did not agree to that because of the concern that in the days ahead, 
that other jurors could test positive. And we are now on week four of this trial. There has been a lot of evidence presented, as well as, uh, as uh, grilling testimony from, gripping testimony from multiple witnesses. And the last thing that either side want to go through again is another one of these yeah. trials, Hallie. Yeah, man, already been four weeks here. Uh, we expect it to go a, a little while longer, too. Von Hilliard, thank you very much Thanks for that. Her. So from the West Coast to the Upper Midwest, you've got 80 million of us under some kind of weather alert, bracing for snow or for a lot of rain or for really windy conditions. Some places are already seeing it with wind speeds up to 60 miles an hour. Look at where the radar is tracking here. That storm is going to move further east tomorrow. So... Hey, central part of the country, get ready. You're going to get a ton of water. A second and stronger storm follows right behind that and into the south with chances of tornadoes. It comes as storms slammed the south throughout the past few weeks, knocking down power lines, destroying homes. Let's bring in meteorologist Bill Karen. So, Bill, the south got a break. It appears to have been a short-lived break. What's on the way? Uh, this will be one of those weeks, Hallie, where Washington, D.C. is warmer than Phoenix. And so when we get weeks like this... What? Yeah, easily. Uh, so when we get weeks like this, you know things are kind of turned upside down and they're going to shake a little bit, and that's where we're going to get some volatile weather. So here's our two storms. One is actually heading right over the top of Arizona at the current time. It's snowing in the high elevation of Arizona. This is the second storm that'll come down and swoop right behind that one. There's big wind makers with these two storms. We'll have a lot of power outages to deal with tomorrow. Well, I mean, we're going from California all the way now over to Nashville with wind advisories or wind watches, 74 million people. I think the areas that have the best chances for, you know, power outages will be the mountainous areas outside of L.A., especially you get in the valleys, you know, heading into those mountain passes. Arizona's going to get pretty good. And look at these wind gusts in North Texas, up to 63 miles per hour. So even in North Texas, by your standards, that'll probably give you some isolated power outages. Then the snowy side of this storm, this is mostly higher elevations, although Portland, Oregon tonight, you're going to go over to a little bit of snow, maybe a slushy inch when you wake up in the morning. And then we will get some snow in areas like Denver. Not a lot. It looks like maybe about one to three inches. And then through Kansas, I-70 is not going to be a fun drive Tuesday and Wednesday through the middle of the country. And just a little bit of snow, Hallie, for Des Moines and areas up here around Green Bay. But the thing that you were just mentioning, severe weather starts Wednesday. This is their Little Rock and Memphis. It's the same areas, Hallie, that we've dealt with time and again, and this will continue even into Thursday in these same areas from the south, right through Tennessee, Kentucky, and maybe even Ohio. So when you talk about Washington being warmer than Phoenix, <laughs> D.C., I mean, is that because Washington's going to be so warm or because Phoenix is going to be so cold? It's both, actually. Uh, Phoenix may drop down to 33 degrees as we go to Thursday morning, pretty late in the season for them to have a freeze. And in the meantime, if you're anywhere from the Midwest to the Great Lakes, I mean, Chicago tomorrow, 53 degrees, St. Louis at 60. Hallie, the leaves are coming out three to four weeks early in areas of the Mid-Atlantic. I mean, it's, we're not supposed to be dealing with, like, with flowers coming up, pollen in and leaves out already. My allergies, yes. Uh, look at this. Washington, D.C. on Wednesday, 68 degrees in the middle of February. Bill Karens, what a world. You're going to have a busy week. Thank you, yeah. friend. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, you've got several people hurt, some of them seriously, after a U-Haul swerved onto sidewalks in New York City. Look at this. We're hearing more from police tonight about a potential motive. We'll tell you about it live in a second. Plus, officials are warning Americans, do not travel to Russia. If that seems obvious, we'll explain why. More details in the five things. Stay with us. Tens of thousands of people are protesting in Israel. We'll tell you why coming up in the five things. But first, a U-Haul driver tonight is in custody after what police are calling a violent rampage in New York City. This truck hit eight people in Brooklyn today, including a police officer. Look at this. That's what it looked like there. Two people are now in critical condition. Still no word on a motive, but New York's police commissioner says there's no indication right now this was terrorism. It comes the same day that a jury will begin considering the death penalty for an Islamic extremist found guilty for killing eight people on a New York City bike path back in 2017. Also a ramming incident. New York has not executed anybody since 1960. NBC's Tom Winter is following all of this and joins us now. So there is a suspect in custody, a 62-year-old. What else do we know? 
Right, so that individual law enforcement officials have identified to us, Hallie, is Wang Soar. Uh, this individual is somebody who's been on law enforcement's radar before in multiple states, either racking up tickets or uh, actually pleading guilty to felonies in Nevada. So he's not a stranger to police. He's somebody who, uh, to your point, yes, there's no indication at this point that there's terrorism, uh, but there are certain statements that he may have made at the scene uh, that indicate that this is some sort of a deliberative act. Uh, no charges yet have been filed, and so that's that's obviously something, Hallie, that we'll be keeping an eye on in the hours ahead. So how does this play into, I mean, the, the coincidence, right, apparent coincidence have been happening the same day as this um, sentencing phase is about to begin for that other incident that was very high profile in New York City in 2017. Sure, exactly right. And so you're talking about the trial of Seifulo Saipov. He's the individual who, and we saw a video before, uh, was driving this uh, driving this uh, Home Depot rented truck. You're just looking at it there on screen and killed a number of individuals on the West Side Highway. It is unusual that we would have uh, uh, a case here in New York uh, State uh, where they haven't executed anybody in a considerable amount of time uh, that that would uh, that there would be a death penalty case. This is a federal trial, and so it's been decades. Here as well, since we've had a federal death penalty trial here, having sat through one of those in the case of Johar Sarneyev, the Boston bomber, uh, he and his brother, it is like a three or four week funeral, Hallie. It is just a retching testimony uh, wow. from the victims' families, and it is something that will undoubtedly have a huge impact on the jurors who will have to consider mitigating factors why somebody should not get that death penalty. Of course, it is important for us to note uh, that the uh, death penalty actually being administered is something that has uh, been suspended under the Biden administration by Attorney General Merrick Garland. That's a good point. Tom Winter, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the U.S. Embassy in Moscow is telling Americans don't travel to Russia and if you're already there, leave. They're concerned about what they're calling the unpredictable consequences of Russia's invasion of Ukraine nearly a year later, like maybe Americans being singled out or detained or even forced to fight in the war. Number two, tens of thousands of people in Israel protesting outside parliament today. Look at this. If you're like, why are they there? Well, these demonstrators don't want to see the government overhaul the country's legal system. The prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, and his allies say judges have too much power the protesters say this plan would destroy democratic checks and balances. They say Netanyahu has a conflict of interest. He's on trial, remember, for corruption charges. He denies wrongdoing. Number three, Cyclone Gabrielle slamming New Zealand's biggest city today. You've got streets flooded, hundreds of flights canceled, libraries, most schools are closed, and you can see this, tons of water, no power for tens of thousands of people. People are being asked, go outside only if you absolutely need to, like go get medicine or food or whatever. It's the second big storm to hit Auckland in just the last few weeks. Number four, we saw WNBA star Brittany Griner out in public a couple times over the weekend. She and her wife were at the Super Bowl yesterday. And yes, they're wearing Eagles jerseys. I noticed that, did you? On Saturday, the day before, Griner was at a golf tournament in Phoenix. There she is flashing the peace sign to the crowd. She's only been seen in public one other time since her release from a Russian prison in December. Number five, I love you, you love me. Everybody loves Barney because the big purple dinosaur is apparently coming back. Mattel says it's relaunching the Barney franchise with a new animated series next year. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when Barney and Friends went off the air in 2010. When we come back, Adidas. Remember they cut ties with Kanye West back in October? They are still dealing with the blowback from the whole yay thing. What they say they're gonna have to do with all that leftover merchandise, it's a fascinating business story. Next. More than a week after that train derailment in Ohio, folks there are trying to get back to at least some kind of normal today. We'll tell you why that's so challenging for them in the local. But first, you saw Adidas shares kind of flat today after a big drop last week with the company still trying to figure out what to do with basically a billion dollars worth of unsold Yeezy shoes and clothes and other stuff. You remember Adidas ended its partnership with Ye, formerly Kanye West after he said a whole bunch of anti-Semitic things last October. The company got some heat for waiting like two weeks to even comment 
on what Ye said, let alone drop him. There was backlash there. So now you've got Adidas warning investors. They may be looking at a $1.3 billion loss on all this leftover stuff. So they're stuck here. Do they try to relabel everything? Do they try to go sell it in smaller markets? Do they just write the whole thing off as a loss? Let's bring in NBC Business and Data reporter Brian Chung to break it all down. So, Brian, you know, this is an interesting look, I think, at where business meets um, culture, right? Because here you have Kanye West, yay, coming out. He said reprehensible things that were anti-Semitic. Adidas was like, waited so long that people started being like, Adidas, what are you waiting for? Drop him here. They ultimately did. Now they have all this apparel. They have all these shoes. What are they going to do with it? Yeah, well, the expectation is that they're going to write it off in some form. And this is such a substantial part of the business. That cannot be uh, stated enough. They made a huge bet when they signed Kanye West to the brand. They, by the way, took him away from Nike at the time. It was massive for the Adidas brand, but ultimately now they're dealing with about $1.3 billion of a revenue hit because of all of these shoes and slippers that they have that are associated with a man that they eventually had to drop last October after, quote, violating the company's values of diversity and inclusion, mutual respect and fairness, end quote, after his anti-Semitic remarks. Now, the big question here is how is that going to impact Adidas going forward now that they've dropped what was previously a substantial part of their business, not only only are they going to take that $1.3 billion revenue uh, potential loss, but it's also going to impact uh, their uh, uh, other financial metrics like their operating profit by about half a billion dollars. Massive for a brand that's uh, global and as substantial as Adidas. Can I ask a question? Can they like not color over like the easy logo. Can they just do something else to the stuff and then resell them just like normal Adidas things? Yeah, Hallie, this is a rare situation where I can kind of put on my hat as a sneaker enthusiast and say they, they really oh, right, can't. Please. Because, yeah, okay. well, I mean, the, these silhouettes are very interesting because it's not like the Nike uh, brand, for example, where the Air Jordan 1s have a massive swoosh. These shoes don't say, you can see photos of it, they don't say Yeezy on the side of them. Right. So you can't really mask it. And people that are familiar with what a Yeezy 350 or a Yeezy 700 looks like is going to always assume associated as a Yeezy 350 or a Yeezy 700. And that's a big reason why Adidas has said, look, we're going to try to repurpose this in some other way, kind of see if we can sell it to people that aren't aware it's associated with Kanye West. But if they can't, it's going to add to an additional write-off of about another half a billion dollars, a, a massive situation if they can't figure that out. What about donation? Is that even a possibility? Yeah, well, it sounds like that's kind of what they're embracing because there's, they say, well, if they can't repurpose it, well, they're going to have to write off another half a billion dollars to their revenues. They could actually have another about $200 million in one-off costs associated with just getting it out the door. A really bad situation, by the way, even outside of this unique situation with Kanye West, all of the retailers dealing with a glut of inventory with a lot of Americans trying to pair back with inflationary pressures. It's interesting. Brian Chung, thank you very much for that breakdown. Appreciate it. Still to come here on the show, are diamonds still forever? More of our couples are saying no thanks. I'll tell you what they're reaching for instead when it comes to their engagements in tonight's original. Stay with us. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Midwest Bureau, students back at school today in East Palestine, Ohio, more than a week after a train derailed. Remember these scenes? You had all those toxic chemicals that got released. School officials say buildings and buses have been cleaned. They say they're working with kids who are not coming back to class yet because keep in mind, hundreds of homes still have to be tested. The EPA says it's found three more chemicals at the site of the derailment. The agency wants the train's operator to take responsibility and then reimburse them for how expensive this cleanup's been. Out of our Southern Bureau, get ready for this kind of bizarro, scary moment at a parade in New Orleans this weekend. So look, that is like a jester's head. A tree whacks it off. Kind of looks like a baseball bat. The whole thing falls. Oh man, somebody fell. Somebody inspecting the float got launched onto the pavement for the whole thing. Nobody got hurt, luckily, although the parade did end up delayed. Also from our Midwest Bureau, you are about to meet on the left side of your screen, Lizzo. On the right, Blizzo. That's the name of one of Minnesota's newest snowplows. That's right. People in Minnesota voted to name one of their snowplows Lizzo. She knows Minnesota. She launched her career there. She called it the highest honor she's ever been given. 
She's won like 100 Grammys, but she loves the snowplow Blizzo. This is why Lizzo is a cultural icon. So tonight's Original Now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And this Valentine's Day, diamonds may be losing their shine. More couples are moving away from diamond rings for engagements. They're choosing other kinds of stones. Some people are even saying no thank you to the ring altogether. Where do you hear what they're doing instead? NBC's Zinkle Esamwa has more. If you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. But for millennials and Gen Zers, engagement rings look a little different these days. Oh my, so sparkly, mm -hmm. just what I wanted. Today, 74% of Gen Z and millennials are open to giving or receiving an engagement ring without a diamond, according to one poll conducted by Minted. That's compared to 66% of their Gen X counterparts and 50% of boomers, signaling a marked shift in the culture. We're staring at all of these diamonds. I know they say diamonds are a girl's best friend, but <laughs> are diamonds out? Diamonds are not out. Amanda Gizzy of Jewelers of America says diamonds are still a popular choice, but with a colorful twist. So if people are turning to colored gemstones, whether it's for a single stone or for side stones to accent their diamonds. Ashley Maziota and Eleanor Cohen picking their engagement stones in Philadelphia. Realizing that just a traditional diamond doesn't make sense for us. We aren't necessarily doing things in the order that is traditional. Among the top materials millennials are open to are metal like gold and platinum and precious stones like emerald, sapphire and ruby. I've never gotten to try on rings for work, okay. so this is very fun. Is there any stone that we should not be using? So you're going to want to avoid any stone that's porous or soft. So those are going to be your opals, your turquoise. Another change, nearly three in five young people prefer to jointly choose rings, with millennials most likely to do so, according to Minted. Emily Philippi says she's noticed a change. There's a lot less of that surprise element now. We see a lot of double proposals. Mm -hmm. Morgan Gingerich and Kyle Caulfield shopping for their forever ring together before popping the question. Instead of just like playing that game and then like me like in secrecy trying to d develop a ring. We wanted something that was unique and that reflected our taste and our personalities. And the hardest part about finding the perfect ring, according to 40% of lovebirds, having the money to buy it. Still, regardless of the rock, the cost of love remains priceless. Zinkle is joining us now. What about the people who aren't getting rings at all? Yeah, Hallie, there are a good number of them. Specifically, that poll says that 15% of young people are actually considering getting tattoos in lieu of a ring. And this is a trend we've even seen among celebrities like Kristen Bell, the Beckhams. We know Beyonce and Jay-Z have matching tattoos as well. And if you're not opting into a tattoo, another trend we've seen is instead of a ring, couples are giving each other other forms of jewelry like watches and necklaces. So really, the universal thread here, Hallie, is gifts that are ethical, personal, and unique both to the couple and the generation. Hallie. Zinkley SMA, thank you very much. Appreciate it. So right now, as we speak, you've got the Chiefs in the air heading home ahead of their Super Bowl victory party in Kansas City Wednesday. And the last few hours, their head coach, Andy Reid, says even at 64 years old, he's not done yet. Even if some of us wish he wasn't in such a good mood today. I've, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And I've got this guy over here that is a pretty good player, so I mean, I'm, we're, we're doing okay. This guy over here, Reed was pointing to this guy on your screen, Patrick Mahomes. I am not so petty as to not acknowledge his title as Super Bowl MVP. He is. He, of course, led the Chiefs to the win, even after he hurt his ankle. I know you're on your way home after having covered it from last night. We are hearing from Patrick Mahomes today. I, I'm, a, I'm a big enough person to be able to open up the floor to him <laughs> because, after all, he and his team did win. Um, I have to imagine he's feeling yeah. good. The question is, how's his injury doing? Yeah, you know, because that was a big question when we saw him hobble off the field after the second quarter into halftime. The question was, would he be able to come back out in the uh, next half? And he was asked about his ankle. Obviously, he was well enough to win the game. But listen to what he said about uh, how it's not only going to not stop him from winning the Super Bowl, but how it's not stopping him from much else. The only thing that might take a, take a hit is my golf game. So I'll have to take a few weeks off of that. He plans to rest it, and he will have time to do that after a quick trip to Disneyland and then, of course, that Super Bowl parade in Kansas City on Wednesday. I'm sorry, Hallie, that it's not in Philly.
You're being shockingly mature, Shaq Brewster. Thank, thank, I mean, not that I'm shocked that you're being mature. You're very mature. I'm just saying I've been a demon, and so thank you. It is obviously a rough Monday for uh, Philadelphia fans good. across the country. Appreciate Big you. Thanks, you. Shaq. <laughs> thank you. That yeah. does it for us this hour. We're going to have more of you here tomorrow. Of course, same time, same place. It's great to be with you. More coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.